Hi everyone, thank you for tuning in to the screencast on cardiac regional wall motion abnormalities. My name is Erica Beatty and I'm a fourth year emergency medicine resident from Université Laval in Quebec City. I would like to thank both the Critical Care POCUS and Emergency Medicine POCUS teams for welcoming me for two months of ultrasound training at London Health Sciences Centre and Western University. Today we will be learning how to identify regional wall motion abnormalities with emphasis on ischemic patterns. Going into the screencast, basic knowledge of cardiac image generation is necessary. If you require information on cardiac image generation, including a basic parasternal long, parasternal short, and apical floor chamber, I suggest referring to any point of care ultrasound textbook and then get lots of practice. We will also discuss the differential diagnosis of regional wall motion abnormalities with a few visual examples and we will briefly touch on some of the other cardiac ultrasound findings that you may see when looking for regional wall motion abnormalities. Ultimately, the findings of your ultrasound will need to be incorporated into the clinical context along with ECG and lab work. The differential diagnosis of regional wall motion abnormalities is quite large. Today, we will be focusing on patterns of ischemia, as these are likely to change your acute management of certain patients. However, prior infarctions, myocarditis, valvular surgeries, depolarization abnormalities, and Takotsubo's cardiomyopathy are all significant causes of wall motion abnormalities and will be touched upon today. Generally speaking, regional wall motion abnormalities can be visualized very early on in the ischemic process, even prior to ECG changes. They can be seen as decreased myocardial excursion, which you can think of as decreased myocardial movement, as well as decreased myocardial thickening. Typically, these movement abnormalities will be described as hypokinesis, or decreased movement, or akinesis, which would be absence of movement. We will see some examples soon, but first, a little terminology. Just to confuse you, every specialty has a different way of naming cardiac regions. Traditional echocardiography divides the heart into 17 segments, which is definitely way more than we need to know for a point of care evaluation. Emergency medicine literature tends to divide the heart into four segments following our traditional ECG territories, namely anteroceptal, inferior, posterior, and lateral. Critical care literature also divides the heart into four segments. However, they use the terminology of septal, anterior, lateral, and inferior. Today, we will use the critical care nomenclature, but it's not worth squabbling over what is the right and wrong nomenclature to use. In general, Using the same nomenclature as ECG findings is very natural for many learners and is still easily understood by colleagues. Choose one nomenclature that is easy for you to remember and stick with it. Just to further confuse you, remember that we divided our heart into four regions when describing our regional wall motion abnormalities. However, at least when dealing with ischemic changes, our heart is more traditionally divided into the distribution of the three major cardiac arteries namely the left anterior descending, the circumflex, and the right coronary artery. There is significant overlap in the vascular distributions, especially in the lateral wall, which can be supplied by the LAD or the circumflex, the septal wall, which can be supplied by the LAD and or the RCA, and the inferior wall, which is supplied by the RCA and or the circumflex. Okay, let's get down to some images. This is a normal parasternal long axis. On the parasternal long axis, we see the inferior wall and the septal wall. This is a parasternal short axis. This is an extremely useful view when evaluating regional wall motion abnormalities because we can see all four regions from one window. When evaluating a parasternal short axis, it is important to identify the septal wall to orient yourself. Sometimes the septal wall will appear directly in your near field, whereas others it will appear on screen left. Once the septal wall has been identified, the other regions can also be identified and evaluated for abnormalities. This is a normal apical four chamber. We can see the inferior aspect of the septal wall as well as the anterolateral wall in this view. The last view I would like to show you is the apical two-chamber view. 
This is not a standard view taught in the POCUS literature. However, it is an additional tool to visualize the posterior inferior wall. Preferably, all regional wall motion abnormalities should be examined from two planes. The posterior inferior wall can only be seen on the parasternal short axis in the traditionally taught three views of cardiac POCUS. So, by adding the apical two chamber, you can further visualize this regional wall motion abnormality or this view can also be used in patients where the parasternal short axis is difficult to obtain. To technically obtain this view, you start from your apical forechamber and then rotate the probe counterclockwise so that it is pointing approximately towards the right shoulder. It is a tough view to obtain in the beginning, but practice makes perfect, so get into the habit of trying it on stable patients during your cardiac exams. Okay, so now that we're all up to speed on the regions, Let's get down to some positive findings. Let's start with our classic left anterior descending or LAD lesion. As we know, our LAD generally perfuses our anterior and septal walls. In this parasternal short axis, we notice good movement, referred to as myocardial excursion, in our inferior septal region as well as our lateral region. However, when evaluating the anteroseptal region, we notice reduced movement we get the impression the anteroseptal wall is just being pulled by the other walls, but not actually contracting. This is a more flagrant example. The anterior and septal walls do not appear to be moving. Only the inferolateral region is contracting. As previously mentioned, the parasternal short axis is a great view to examine all four of our regions at once. However, we always want to get a second view to better appreciate emotion abnormality. For the LAD territory, the apical four chamber is the best alternative view. In this apical four chamber view, we notice decreased movement of the septum and apex and a portion of the anterolateral wall. These movement abnormalities are typical of an LAD lesion. Here is a second example that is very similar to our previous clip. We notice decreased movement of the septum and apex and a portion of the anterolateral wall. Moving on to our right coronary artery. Our right coronary artery generally perfuses the inferior aspect of our heart and can partially perfuse the septal region. Here is an example of an inferoseptal akinesis or lack of contraction in the inferior aspect of the heart that would be consistent with RCA ischemia. Here is a second example of inferior akinesis. The inferior aspect of the heart is also well visualized on our parasternal long axis. Here, we see hypokinesis of the inferior wall consistent with an RCA lesion. On to our circumflex. The circumflex artery typically perfuses the lateral wall. In this parasternal short axis, we get decreased myocardial thickening in the lateral wall. We get the impression that the lateral wall is not contracting, but is rather just getting pulled along for the ride. This decreased thickening and decreased movement can indicate ischemia in the territory of the circumflex artery. We can further see these changes to the lateral wall in an apical four chamber. Again, we see reduced myocardial thickening in the lateral distribution. It is very important to correlate your findings with the ECG. Are the changes that you're seeing related to an acute ischemic event with inverted T waves or ST elevation, or is it just an old STEMI with pathologic Q waves? Here is an approximation of the ECG territories with associated ultrasound territories. Credits for these images go to the EDI course. Don't forget to revisit your differential diagnosis, as many of these diagnoses will have associated ECG changes. I would like to view a few examples of the highlighted pathologies to help with your ultrasound interpretation. This is an example of a prior myocardial infarct in the circumflex territory. Notice the regional wall motion abnormality in the lateral wall? However, this time the myocardium appears thinner than the previous examples. This is due to scarring. Again, 
ECG interpretation will help differentiate ongoing ischemia from an old infarct. This example is perhaps a little bit harder to appreciate, but depolarization abnormalities such as bundle branch blocks or accessory pathways can create the perception of regional wall motion abnormalities. The heart appears to dance or maybe even do the worm in the way that it contracts. Keep your eye out for these because you'll see a lot of them. Last but definitely not the least is the infamous Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. This cardiomyopathy typically causes apical akinesis with basal hyperkinesis. Seeing as we've talked so much about ischemia today, and I hope I've convinced you to start focusing your chest pain patients, I thought it would be prudent to touch briefly on some additional findings that you might want to watch out for in this population. You may see a papillary muscle rupture or pericardial effusion. Less commonly, you may see an intracavitary thrombus or wall aneurysm. Also, keep your eye tuned for inferior wall hypokinesis or akinesis that may indicate an RV infarct, seeing as those infarcts can be easily missed on the ECG by inexperienced physicians. Here's a visual example of a papillary muscle rupture seen on an apical two-chamber view. Here is a pericardial effusion with tamponade seen on an apical four-chamber view. Merci. Thank you for tuning into our screencast on regional wall motion abnormalities. I hope this gives you the confidence to describe your findings and the reflex to grab that probe and image your patients with acute chest pain. Special thanks to Dr. Haley Hobbs and Dr. Frank Mislick for the help with the production of this presentation and screencast.